This episode is made possible by MailChimp. Ever heard of a customer? It's the result of marketers grouping customers with different behaviors into one big mess. But with MailChimp, you can use real-time behavior data to personalize emails for every customer based on their browsing and buying behavior, turning your customers into customers. Intuit MailChimp, the number one email marketing and automations brand. Visit MailChimp.com slash personalize for more information. Based on competitor brands, publicly available data on worldwide numbers for customers in 2021-2022. Availability and features and functionality vary by plan, which are subject to change. And so, however this shakes out, you can undoubtedly see ways in which they will figure out strategies to evolve that align with whatever it is that the outcome of the suit says. Hey gang, it's Monday, October 9th. Zach, Jacob and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Intuit MailChimp. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by two folks. Let's meet them. We start with one of our analysts on our connectivity and tech briefing based out of California. It's Jacob Bourne. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Zach. Glad to be here. Hey, chat. We're also joined by one of our senior analysts covering everything retail and e-commerce. He's based just above Chicago. You may have heard him hanging out on the Reimagining Retail Show, but we've got him today. It's Zach Stamble. Hey, Marcus. Hey, Jacob. Hey, fella. Today's fact. Do you guys know why we call stuffed toy bears teddy bears? Yes. Go. It's uh, due to Teddy Roosevelt, right? It it's is. An ode to Teddy Roosevelt. It is indeed. Jacob, you knew this? That was what I was going to say as well. Yes. Oh, so it's just me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all the listeners might also know this, but I thought this was fascinating. <laughs> so according to the National Park Service, the teddy bear named after President Theodore Roosevelt, who was often referred to as Teddy, is his nickname. So the name originated from an incident on a bear hunting trip in Mississippi in November 1902, when President Roosevelt refused to shoot a captured black bear on a hunt. <laughs> Clifford Berryman, a political cartoonist, lightheartedly satirized the president's refusal to shoot the bear in a Washington Post cartoon. And then two folks, Morris and Rose Mitchton, uh, a couple who owned a Brooklyn candy shop and made stuffed animals, they saw the cartoon and decided to create a stuffed toy bear and dedicate it to the president who refused to shoot a bear. Uh, And they called it Teddy's Bear. And after receiving Roosevelt's permission to use his name, Mitchton mass-produced the uh, toy bears, which were so popular, uh, they soon founded the ideal toy company. Interesting. Not- Why did he not hunt it or shoot it? Because he was an avid hunter. Yes. I think they... I think the bear was, like, pretty... Yeah, because injured. it was trapped, right? Because it was already trapped. Oh, it was trapped. So it's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Fair enough. So he said, yeah. he said no. Um, brother... Ironically, he uh, he hated the nickname Teddy. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys ever have a nickname you hated? Well, hate's a strong no, word. So. Like, not that I knew about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, to strangers, I'm probably just that Australian guy. For the record, <laughs> I'm not from there. Okay, America? <laughs> a number of times. Anyway, today's real topic. What's going on with Amazon's Monopoly trial? In today's episode, first in the lead, we'll cover Amazon's Monopoly trial. Then for another news, we'll discuss Peloton and Lululemon's New Deal and the latest on social media burnout. We start, of course, with the lead. We're talking about Amazon and their Monopoly trial. US regulators have sued Amazon, alleging that the internet giant is illegally maintaining Monopoly power, notes James Clayton and Tom Espiner of the BBC. The Federal Trade Commission, FTC, And 17 states have said Amazon uses a set of interlocking anti-competitive and unfair strategies to push up prices and stifle competition. Amazon says the lawsuit is wrong on the facts and law and that they look forward to making that case in court. The case also relates to another FTC suit filed in June, suggesting that Amazon used deceptive practices to drive consumers to enroll in its Prime membership program. So that's also going on, but we're focusing more on this new 
case that has been filed by the FTC. Zach, I'll start with you. You wrote a piece about this recently. Initial reactions to the case. Yeah, so it's not surprising that this suit came about. It was rather expected. FTC Chair Lena Khan came to prominence as a law student when she wrote a law review article that argued Amazon's anti-competitive and should be broken up. So it isn't unexpected, and it's one piece of a broader puzzle of big tech antitrust reform Mm -hmm. lawsuits that include Google and Meta. Jacob, what came to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I find this to be a particularly polarizing case. I mean, you have these different factions, you know, Zach brought up Lena Khan, then there's Elizabeth Warren, so really seeing this as a big opportunity, long time in the coming. But then there's others who think that the FTC has no case at all here. And that really ultimately that consumers are going to lose if there's an unfavorable outcome for Amazon and basically resulting in, you know, a the loss of those cheaper prices, which which they want. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the tech industry, which is kind of biting their nails. Obviously, this is going to take a long time to play out. But this could certainly, it's a giant case and could have major implications for the tech industry and also, you know, large businesses in the United States across the board. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, in the mix of all that, you know, there are some very frustrated consumers, you know, who aren't in fact happy with Amazon's practices, despite the fact that they still shop there. So there's yeah. a lot going on. There is a lot. We're going to dig into both of the prosecution's case against Amazon and also Amazon's defense. But before I get to that, my initial reaction was it seems on the face of it, it seems like a pretty open and shut case. Like if someone said to you, do you think Amazon's a monopoly? You wouldn't blame people for going, yeah, it's pretty much the only place I buy things online. Right. Not to mention all the other things, parts of my life that they are involved in. And there was an article from Scott Rosenberg, end of 2020. Scott Rosenberg of Axios. And he wrote that the Pentopolis power, so he's talking about the the major five tech companies, the Pentopolis power and reach are unparalleled, saying their products and services reach into every corner of our lives. Google controls access to information. Facebook now meta controls access to people. Amazon controls access to goods. Apple leads the high-end device market. They have half of the smartphones in America. Microsoft still controls the office desktop. Uh, He's saying the Pentopolis combined market cap is now roughly $7 trillion. It was at the time, uh, nearly one third of total value of the S&P 500. The S&P has gone up 14% since then, but it's still, the big five still account for about a quarter of the value. So on the face of it, it's if anyone said, oh, is Google a monopoly? They have their own trial going on right now, antitrust trial. You'd probably say, yeah, probably. Where else do I go? Amazon too. You could argue Meta and others, but there's more to it than that. You have to prove that they are in a court of law. And so we're going to go through uh, some of the details of the case. We're going to start with the case against Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, And so on the face of it, when it comes to US anti-competition legislation, prosecutors have to show that a company acted in a way that hurts consumers financially. But that's a very simplistic way of looking at antitrust law. Jacob, what do you think are some of the main arguments against Amazon at this point coming from the FTC? Yeah. Well, I think first it's important to note that, of course, it's, monopolies aren't inherently illegal in the United States, which is why we have them. Yes. Like why we have companies like Amazon. So the FTC really needs to show that there's harm done by Amazon's monopoly and that it got there through you know illegal practices. And monopolistic one of the ways pra- practices, illegal so monopolistic practices, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. And so one of the ways that, that the FTC is trying to argue this is saying that. Well, Amazon has been bullying uh, third-party sellers on its platform for some time, forcing them to do things like buy pricey ads in order to you know, maintain visibility of their products. The FTC also says that Amazon has been punishing sellers who might you know, list the same products at a lower price on a competitor's platform by downgrading their, their visibility. The FTC is also saying that Amazon has been using a secret algorithm to illegally manipulate prices on the platform. So there's about 20 different charges, and, and those are some of the, I guess, the probably the ones that are kind of the hottest topics. Mm-hmm. There's one other area that I think is really interesting in front of mind, particularly for me, but I think to the case itself, and that's Prime. Prime is such a focal point mm-hmm. of the Amazon ecosystem, and Prime has such a hold on the American consumer. Our forecast has 71.3% of U.S. households holding a Prime membership, and it's really incumbent upon sellers to use fulfillment by Amazon to access those consumers to get that badge that what they're selling is Prime eligible. Because if you have Prime membership, you're probably not buying something that 
isn't prime eligible. And so that goes to what you were saying just a few moments ago, Jacob, of <laughs> Amazon pushing sellers toward right. using its services. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So we've got, just to list those again, so we've got anti-discounting measures, supposedly from Amazon, punishing merchants for offering lower prices elsewhere. We've also got sellers on Amazon compelled to a certain extent to use their logistic service. If you want your goods to appear in Amazon Prime, which one of the huge perks of that is, is faster shipping times that Zach was just mentioning. Uh, you've also got this concern over Amazon operating a third party marketplace whilst operating its own first party retail business. Yeah, And the suit suggesting that third mar- party marketplace pushes sellers to use and pay for the advertising to reach consumers and access its yeah. shipping and delivery network. And the backdrop of all that is that, you know, the FTC says, Sellers don't really have an option. You have to sell on Amazon if you're going to have any traction in the marketplace. And so that's also an important piece of this. Yeah. I mean, we're going to give the kind of counter to this in a second, but how much truth is there to this stuff? Like Amazon just going to say, oh, well, you can go elsewhere. You don't have to advertise if you don't want to. Like, I mean, Zach, how important has advertising on Amazon become to Amazon sellers at this point? It's incredibly important to sellers. Basically, if whatever you search for on Amazon, you're going to be bombarded with ads, whether you realize it or not. So if you want to reach consumers, you kind of have to pay that toll of the ad. Mm-hmm. Hey. Yeah. It seems as though this- they, Pay to play. Right. And they, they, they've got a nickname for it. They're calling it uh, part of this, the Amazon tax. The FTC is saying that many sellers pay nearly 50% of their revenue to Amazon. They're calling it an Amazon tax when all their fees are combined and saying that these costs could be passed on to the consumer if folks weren't having to pay so much to play, as Jacob said. They're also, the suit alleging Amazon degrades the customer experience by replacing organic search results with paid ads. So that part, I agree with to some extent, because obviously what you see when you search is an ad for nearly all the results. Like you kind of have to scroll really far. Mm -hmm. That said, what Amazon has been very effective with is still delivering relevancy. And so when you search something, you do get decent results, but that's because everyone has had to pay for ads. So they're able to finally tune what it is they present you to what it is that you're searching for. Right, right. One other component of this, so Sarah Morrison of Vox saying the lawsuit also addresses Amazon's buy box. She explains that when several sellers offer the same product, Amazon picks which one gets the sale when a customer clicks to make a purchase. So whether add to cart or buy now, that's the buy box, that little area. And everyone else is relegated to an other sellers section further down the page. Most folks don't even bother to look at that or don't know it. it's there. And so being in the buy box is crucial, noting that sellers pretty much have to use Amazon's fulfilled by Amazon logistics and shipping service to be eligible for it. How much credence is there to this argument? It's absolutely true. How often do you click and look at the other sellers selling the same product? Mm-hmm. I never do. Right. But can Amazon say, well, you can, it's there. Or is it a case of like dark patterns where it's there, you know, it's there for you to click on something like uh, opt out, but it's in gray and it's in smaller fonts and it's sometimes hidden on the page. And so maybe there's a case of, okay, yes, it's there, but it's not as obvious as it should be to folks. The other final part here is just the 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 optics of this. Again, they have to prove in a court of law that this is the case that Amazon, to what Jacob was saying, you know, isn't just a monopoly, but has been engaging in monopolistic practices. Because similar to Google, on the face of it, Amazon's a literal monopoly across multiple. And it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be hard for the judge to kind of they're gonna have to, but like decouple their thinking of Amazon from all the other places that it is also, you know, in large part, a monopoly. So right. Amazon I accounts just, for close to- I, You keep saying it, but I don't know that that's really true. I mean, it doesn't even account for the majority of retail e-commerce sales in the United States. It's like 37.6%. And so, yes, right. it has a major hold on e-commerce, but it's not a monopoly. But the problem is the second place is Walmart and they have 7%, right? So like six times smaller. So you're right, it's not like yeah. it's 80%. It's a yeah. good point, and, yeah. and, and that should be taken into consideration. I, again, though, it's not so much whether or not it's a monopoly, it's whether it's a harmful monopoly. I think, yes. I think that's really what the FTC really needs to prove here, yes. which might is going to be much more difficult than proving that it's a monopoly. 
Yes. Yeah, the great points. Because, yeah, if you look at that space, Zach, you're right. Yeah, it's about close to 40%, 37%, 38% of the US online shopping market, according to our forecasts. But then you've got two thirds of American adults, prime people, according to consumer intelligence research partners. We have a similar number as well. Amazon's the world's largest cloud computing company, third largest digital ad player in the US in terms of revenue. They're closing in on second place Meta. They are the top selling voice assistant in the Echo device. They are uh, make the top selling streaming device in the Fire TV. They have over 80% of the ebook market, according to Codex. And they are quite literate. I mean, Amazon makes close to $540 billion in annual revenue. That is more than any other public company in the world, except Walmart, according to data from SP Global Market Intelligence. That said, again, you've got to prove it. This is just shows just how big they are in different spaces, it doesn't prove monopolistic anti competitive behavior. Let's move to their defense then, Zach. What's Amazon going to come back with when they start the defense of this case? Well, I think it starts with what I was just saying a moment ago. It's not a monopoly. The majority of online sales in the U.S. aren't on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, I think they can say, you know, sellers can decide whether they want to pay for ads. They can decide whether they want to pay for services. They don't have to. They can still reach consumers. And there's a ton of consumers on Amazon, many of whom, which can be a small portion, but it can still be a lot of people who do click, who do scroll and do find these other sellers. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think what they are saying is, if you take action and you break us up or you cause us to alter our practices or whatever it might be, you're actually gonna harm consumers. You're gonna see higher prices, you're gonna see slower deliveries, and you're gonna hurt the small businesses that are the backbone of the Amazon marketplace. Mm -hmm. How much truth to that do you think there is? Is it because a lot of this is going to be PR? You're going to have fewer it products is. to choose from, higher prices, slow deliveries, less options for small businesses, is what they've said. I mean, if you see this playing out and something does happen to Amazon, do you think that's really going to be the case? Yes and no. I think it really depends how it ultimately shakes out. I think Amazon's an incredibly innovative company that has always looked ahead to the next thing and identified it and pushed ahead toward that particularly with delivery, particularly with retail and media, but really everywhere. And so however this shakes out, you can undoubtedly see ways in which they will figure out strategies to evolve that align with whatever it is that the outcome of the suit says. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob, what do you think? So I mean, you know, the argument here is you don't have to go to Amazon. You can go elsewhere. And it seems like that's, I mean, how many competitors does Amazon really have in that regard? Because let's move into like the Google case for a second, talking about the antitrust case that they're dealing with. Google was paying folks like Apple to be the default, whereas mm-hmm. with Amazon is like, well, people are choosing to go to Amazon. Google was able to say, oh, well, there's, there, or at least they are able to say, well, people can go to Amazon. People, you know, most people are starting their shopping searches on Amazon. People mm-hmm. can go to TikTok. A lot of young people, majority of Gen Zers are starting to look for things on TikTok, ChatGPT as yeah. well. Something me and you talk about a lot. People can go to, to ChatGPT and find things. So it seems like there is, uh, even though they're not uh, direct competitors in terms of being in the same space, search, they are indirect competitors and pretty large. I mean, Amazon, what do you think their main defense is going to be? I mean, I think Amazon has a pretty solid defense just with saying, look, Doc was saying that, you know, that it's not a monopoly in terms of not, you know, crushing other major e-commerce players. And I think that it, what it ultimately means is the FTC has an uphill battle in winning this case. I think at the end of the day, it's going to be about the FTC proving that sellers themselves were directly harmed by Amazon's practices versus showing that, for example, that Amazon harms consumers. I mean, the fact mm-hmm. of the matter is that people shop on Amazon because they can find cheaper prices on Amazon. So it's really hard to argue that it's hurting consumers when, at least according to Bloomberg, in 2022, Amazon's prices were 14% lower than the competition. So, I mean, that's a huge margin. Mm. So I really think that the burden is actually on the FTC, not Amazon here in this case. I think the FTC is going to have to prove that Amazon intentionally hurt sellers to stifle competition. And that would be a concern, I think, for regulators because a lot of these sellers are small businesses. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily the e-commerce monopoly that's going to be the crux of this case. The one other thing I would say is the FTC can win even if it doesn't win. If it causes 
Amazon to alter some of its practices, if it causes it to tweak its behaviors in some sort of ways, over the course of the next few years before we see a trial or anything else, then maybe that's a win even if the actual outcome is an Amazon victory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on what we mean by a win. Certainly, it would be one of the you know first major antitrust wins. But I think this case is going to have a lot of public perception elements to it just because of how you know visible Amazon is in people's lives. And if a settlement were reached and you know, Amazon had to change its business practices and then it resulted in higher prices, then I don't think that that really is a win ultimately for the FTC or the US government. Mm. The higher prices thing is interesting because I, for the longest time, Amazon was all about like low price, but Amazon doesn't always end the low price anymore. Not always. It's yeah, really that is, about that's convenience. Yeah. That right. is the play that Amazon leans into. Mm-hmm. When you click and the thing you bought is on your doorstep like a few hours later, that's so convenient. And that's really why and how Amazon keeps people clicking and buying. Yeah, yeah, I wonder how much of it is the, uh, ingrained in people's subconscious because they, there was the place they went for lower prices. Now it's more for convenience, but in the back of their head, they're also thinking, well, I'm here for convenience, but I'm also probably getting some yeah. of the lower prices because I used to. I mean, I, I think the prices, it really varies. I mean, some prices have gone up with inflation, but for other items, I think that they have continued to maintain yeah. kind of the cheapest on the market in terms yeah. of prices. All right. So most likely outcomes, and we covered a couple, Scott Rosenberg of Axio saying it's going to be up to the federal judge in Washington state because Amazon was born in Seattle to decide whether the case and evidence is strong enough to rule that Amazon should be charged. Could be A, liable for damages, fines, B, structural remedies, uh, think limits on its conduct or even some kind of breakup, or C, nothing. You know, there has been yeah. a lot of expectation since FTC boss Lena Carr took the job. Zach explained why her background as a, a Yale law student and, and publishing that paper in 2017, arguing American tr- antitrust laws had failed to stop Amazon from amassing power over its customers, competitors and, suppli- and suppliers. She already had two losses in February. FTC lost an attempt to stop Meta from buying VR company within for $400 million. And then July, FTC lost to attempt to block Microsoft from completing its deal to buy maker of Call of Duty Activision Blizzard for close to $70 billion. The case is, is expected to play out over several years. So don't stay tuned. You can tune out and come back to us <laughs> in, yeah. uh, at the next World Cup. That's so all we've got time for for the lead. We'll skip the halftime report. We've talked about it enough. Time for the second half of the show today in other news. Peloton and Lululemon strike a deal. And where are we at with social media burnout? Story one. Zach, you just wrote about Peloton and Lululemon striking a deal that ends the company's connected fitness rivalry. You explained that as part of the deal, Lululemon will stop selling its Studio Mirror home fitness device this year and will bring Peloton's content to its exercise app. And Peloton, who tried to build their own apparel collection, will make Lululemon its primary athletic apparel partner. But to you, Zach, what's the most important sentence in your article and why? I think this deal is just the latest and highest profile sign that the connected fitness bubble has burst. Mir just like crashed and fell to pieces. Peloton is really struggling, but the deal ultimately makes a whole lot of sense. I I mean, both companies can do what it is that they actually do well and not try to embark on some other business that is wholly distinct from their bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the bubble bursting and you're pointing out some of the numbers we have for the number of American connected fitness users and how it's already peaked, reached 41 million folks who were connected fitness users in the US last year. This year, 1 million fewer people will call themselves connected fitness users and that decline will continue reaching 39 million in just two years time, according to our forecast team. Story two, Jacob, one of your most recent articles reads, social media users report burnout from viral content culture. Social media users, you explain, are reporting fatigue and disillusionment with platforms. What to you is the most important sentence in this piece and why? Yeah. So here's a quote from 23-year-old Walid Muhammad. He says, 
I'm honestly just tired of social media. I'm tired of consuming content all the time. And I think this quote is really just a broader symptom of social media malaise. And I think tech companies have kind of forgotten to a degree that people are social creatures and they want to interact. They want to have meaningful interactions with regular people. And, and what's happening is a lot of users are going on these platforms. They're seeing very highly curated content. They're feeling like it's an entertainment space. They might be experiencing some toxicity. And what that's doing is it's driving people to these small private group chats. Now, the problem with that is that small private group chats don't have the kind of ad revenue potential that the main feed of the platform has. So I think, you know, for, for platforms to kind of get things back on track, to attract users to the public sphere again, I think it really means it's going to come down to them giving users more control over the experiences that they have in the platforms. I really like your quote. Tech companies are out of touch with what users want, more of the social aspects and less of the media uh, just yeah. about, uh, with recommendation algorithms having eroded uh, their original purpose. And yeah, you had some numbers in there from our remarkable forecasting team uh, yeah. showing social media users. Next year, 1 million, 1 million Americans who are 43 and older will stop using social networks at wow. least once wow. a month. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the, the tide's changing there. Red alerts for social media companies. In other yes. Ways. That's yeah. remarkable. Younger people, I think Gen Z is still going up slightly. Right. Millennials was pretty much flat, but up a tiny bit. But a million Americans over the age of 43 will stop using social networks at least monthly. That's what we've got time for for this episode. Thank you so much, gents, for hanging out today. Thank you to Jacob. Marcus, Zach, it's been a pleasure. Yes, indeed. Thank you to Zach. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show, and James, who copy edits it. Stuart, who runs the team. And thanks to everyone for listening in. Uh, if you want to sign up for the retail briefing that Zach writes for or the connectivity and tech briefing that Jacob contributes to, you can click the links below in the show notes. We'll hopefully see you tomorrow, though, for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an email podcast made possible by Intuit MailChimp. Oh.